everyone. Happy Friday. I am coming to you from Australia, where it's actually tomorrow. It's Saturday. Uh, I got a head start on life uh, by coming down here and uh, getting across the international dateline. And I can assure you, the world still exists tomorrow, which uh, sometimes over the last couple of years, we've <laughs> wondered where that was headed. But uh, yeah, we're still here. And uh, the weather's lovely uh, in Australia, but uh, I'll be glad to get home to Canada in a couple of weeks. And uh, you don't know, you don't want to know what time it is right now in Australia. So uh, you can Google it if you're really curious. Uh, anyways, here we are at uh, week 10 uh, of our course, the last uh, session where we kind of close the circle and uh, talk a little bit. Uh, you know, we've so far described the economy uh, that we live in, how it works, how things fit together, all of the different elements of it work investment, production, income, uh, reproduction uh, in the economic sense of the word, uh, the role of government, uh, the role of the environment, the role of uh, um, uh, the financial sector. And uh, today we're going to wrap it up and I'm going to give some ideas on how do we evaluate the economy that we live in, uh, how could we improve the economy we live in, and then are there even ways to think of completely different uh, approaches to organizing uh, our economic activity, uh, our work, our income, our consumption, our reproduction. Uh, so uh, let's uh, let's kick this off here. I will uh, quickly call up uh, the screen here, and away we go. Economics for everyone. I do want to uh, first of all congratulate uh, all of you. This is your graduation uh, from uh, our Economics for Everyone course, and um, I do want to uh, acknowledge uh, those of you who stuck with it. Tremendous uh, turnout uh, in uh, in all of the uh, sessions, and and thank you for your uh, your energy and your ideas and your uh, questions, uh, which I thought were fabulous. I really enjoyed uh, all of the question sessions, and I also want to offer my thanks to uh, Lisa and uh, the whole team at Later Life Learning. Uh, it's just been a, a real pr pleasure and a privilege uh, to work with folks who've been so uh, professional and uh, gracious uh, at setting up the uh, the lectures and handling the technology and picking the songs uh, to play at the beginning and uh, facilitating the questions and everything. I've really enjoyed this, but especially thank you to those who've joined uh, our class from all over the world um, and uh, and. Uh, expressed your willingness to dive in the deep end uh, of economics and uh, challenge the assumption that it's a technical mathematical subject that should be left to the experts. Uh, as I said at the beginning, economics is too important to be left to the economists. Uh, now you've all got, uh, hopefully, uh, a bit more knowledge, uh, more familiarity with the jargon and uh, confidence to jump into to economic debate. Uh, I want to just put forward uh, a few ways that uh, I hope we can all stay in touch uh, as we go forward. First of all, uh, our Center for Future Work has a, a contact list, an email list, uh, where we send out a message. We don't spam you uh, about once every six to eight weeks uh, with an update on our research and commentary and videos and other stuff that we do. Uh, if you would like to join that list, uh, I invite you. Uh, what you do is you'd go to the Center for Future Work website. So there it is, Center for Future Work. Uh, that's easy. And then uh, you see there's a uh, contact button there at the top that you would uh, press. And then that takes you to uh, a contact page. And at the bottom of that, uh, there's an area where you just enter your name and email address and you'll be automatically uh, on our list. And uh, that's an easy way uh, to stay in touch with uh, the research that we do, uh, which obviously has a focus on labor and um, work and employment issues. But uh, also we dive into the whole set of uh, other debates uh, that are out there uh, as well. So uh, that's one way uh, for us to stay in touch. Uh, secondly, I do want to note uh, that we are going to post videos of all the lecture components uh, from our course, uh, just the lectures, not the Q&A session. Um, and uh, we've uh, been recording them with the help of the Later Life Learning folks, and we're going to put them up as an ongoing uh, resource uh, for people to use. Uh, so uh, they're not there yet, but uh, give us a week or two to get them produced and posted. And uh, there, to find those, you would go to that web page that we've had for um, the Later Life Learning course on our uh, page, the, the area, and that's where you click on the online learning button uh, on our homepage and then choose uh, the Later Life Learning course. And uh, that's where we've already been posting the course outline, the glossary, the handouts from the course, et cetera. And now, uh, once we've produced them, we'll have the video. So uh, if there was something you missed uh, or uh, uh, and a topic that you uh, just uh, love so much, you want to watch it again, uh, go and visit that. 
uh, and then we'll post them uh, here uh, along with all of the um, handouts and slides and so on. Uh, I also want to just suggest a couple of uh, resources for people who are interested in economics and pursuing some alternative approaches uh, to economics. Uh, I'll give you three of my favorite. You can obviously uh, do a whole lot of research and digging around, but uh, three of my favorite. Uh, one is the, the website that goes along with the book that we use in this course, economicsforeveryone.ca. And uh, there's some uh, supplementary material. There's a list of extra readings you can do. There's even an economics word search puzzle, okay? Be believe me, that, that is unusual. Uh, and uh, where you can uh, search for the names of dead economists, another interesting topic. So uh, check that one out. Uh, another important site uh, is the Canadian Center for Policy Alternatives, which is uh, another think tank that I volunteer with, policyalternatives.ca. They've got a whole set of uh, resources uh, with uh, economic and policy arguments uh, on a whole all a whole range of issues that um, uh, that uh, are affected or relevant in Canada today. And then the last uh, site that I'll uh, recommend is a, a site for a, a network called the Progressive Economics Forum. Uh, Progressive-economics.ca is the website. And the Progressive Economics Forum is um, a very kind of simple network for uh, economists in universities, but also outside of universities uh, like myself, and just interested people, and uh, it's uh, been its its motivation or its mission is to uh, try and round out the uh, debate over economics with a, a range of uh, broader uh, materials and perspectives. Um, finally, uh, let's uh, keep talking uh, on social media. So uh, there's my Twitter handle and the Sanders Twitter handle, and we're both on Facebook. So uh, if you'd like, you can post something from the course or tell the world what you thought of the course and uh, stay in touch with us uh, this way. Um, we also post uh, links to some of our research uh, and so on. So once again, thanks everybody for your uh, interest in sticking with the course, and I hope we can kind of stay in touch. Now, one thing that I've noted over and over is uh, every time we talk about something in this course, the next week, um, amazing things happen uh, in that very topic. And uh, this week was no exception on a, on a couple of points. Um, you remember last week we talked about the economics of the pandemic and um, some of the lessons learned from the pandemic and perhaps some of the lasting policy changes that we should make uh, as a result of uh, COVID-19. Uh, today, just this morning, I've got uh, a commentary piece in the Globe and Mail uh, on uh, how one way that Canada should respond to the pandemic, which is to uh, implement a permanent uh, paid sick leave program. Uh, when the pandemic hit, um, almost no jurisdictions in Canada required employers to give workers paid time off. And uh, the problem with that is if people think they're going to lose all their pay or if people do lose all their pay, uh, if they stay home when they're sick, they're going to feel compelled to go to work anyways. And that's bad enough just during flu season to show up and think you're doing a very loyal job and infect all of your colleagues in the COVID or pandemic or a serious health situation. That's a, a recipe for disaster. So uh, the government put in place various uh, temporary measures. So did some of the provinces. Uh, but now we're debating whether those measures should continue or not. And uh, this is my argument that they, they should. The federal government has announced it's going to go ahead with 10 days in federally regulated industries. Those are industries like banking, telecommunications, uh, interprovincial provincial uh, transportation. Uh, the provinces are having lots of debate and the business community is saying, no, 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 that was just a one-off deal during the pandemic. We got to get back to normal world where if we give people pay to stay home sick, then everyone's going to invent uh, illness. And that's just a very uh, short-sighted uh, view. And I, I'm arguing against it here. Another uh, thing that's also out today uh, in our real-time economics, uh, Statistics Canada has just released their monthly employment data for November. Uh, we had talked earlier in the course uh, about how as of September, we had regained the total level of employment in Canada that uh, existed before the pandemic, and that, that was quite an achievement. Uh, we had a, a number in October and then November today. Look at the line there at the end. It was a blockbuster report today. 158,000 new jobs uh, in Canada uh, in uh, the month of November and uh, unemployment rate declined to 6%. So uh, the things that we've done in Canada to try and respond to the pandemic, including all of those income support programs uh, that the government put in have been very, very important. So just a little up, uh, update, real time update uh, on some of the topics that we've covered before that are in the news today. Uh, that's the thing about uh, economics uh, that I love.
Okay, well, let's get on to the uh, actual topic for today, uh, building a fairer, sustainable economy. We've studied uh, the economy and how it fits together and uh, all the pieces and parts, moving parts. And uh, along the way, we've been raising some concerns about things like inequality and uh, pollution, uh, um, unemployment. Uh, how do we make things better uh, in the economy, which has always been part of my mission as an economist. And I think uh, most economists, if they're honest, have got a vision of what they think the economy should be. They're not just there to study it. They're there to try and uh, improve it. And uh, I certainly uh, am motivated by that. Some of the topics uh, we'll cover today, we're going to evaluate uh, the economy that we live in, capitalism, and give it a report card. We'll talk about some of the problems in capitalism and ask if uh, if it's going to break down. Um, we'll talk about ways to improve capitalism, how to pay for the improvements that we'd like. Uh, but we'll also talk a little bit uh, at the end uh, more broadly about uh, other alternative economic systems that we could consider, what they look like and whether they're consistent with human nature or not. Um, here are some of the terms that we'll uh, cover in today's class. And uh, those are the ones, again, that are defined in the online glossary that's uh, available on that website that I showed you earlier, the Later Life Learning website. And uh, please uh, visit there for a bit more information. So open question, does capitalism work? Uh, well, here's a, uh, here's a high tech graphical uh, answer to the question. We've got uh, housing meltdown, failed bank, sovereign debt crisis, toxic derivatives uh, on the economic landscape. Uh, the one guy there on the left, I think he works for the International Monetary Fund perhaps. It needs a little fine tuning, but I think the basic system is working well. Uh, but of course, uh, it, in some ways, in many ways, uh, it's not. Uh, my answer to that question, does the economy we live in work, is a classical two-handed economist answer. Yes and no uh, at the same time. On the one hand, the system survives. It carries on. It maintains. Uh, it's had lots of problems and crises and challenges, but it has responded in all kinds of ways that you might not expect and um, adjusted and carried on. Uh, so in that regard, I do not expect that capitalism has somehow got inherent flaws that are gonna cause it to collapse of its own accord. So in that regard, on its terms, that is its ability to continue on, uh, the answer to capitalism is, does it work? Yes, as a system, it can, it can sustain itself. On the other hand, think back to our initial discussion about what is the economy. The economy is the sum total of our work. And why do we work? We work to produce the goods and services we need to survive and thrive. Uh, the purpose of the economy is to meet human needs, to give us a good life and uh, one that uh, we can enjoy and be healthy and live long and prosper. Uh, and also in the context of a natural environment that we live in, and we have to uh, pay attention to that. And on those grounds, in terms of meeting human needs, the system clearly, uh, in many ways, does not work. Uh, there are many ways in which um, the economy that we have um, fails to meet human needs of people in Canada and even more so uh, people in other countries around the world. Um, we uh, earlier on said, how do we evaluate uh, the economy? <coughs> Excuse me. How do we evaluate the economy? And we emphasize not by which economy grows GDP the fastest. Uh, GDP is an important measure, but it isn't the goal. Uh, the goal is meeting human needs. Uh, and we said it kind of depends on what your own subjective criteria are. There's no objective measuring stick um, about whether it's meeting human needs or not. Um, I had proposed, and, and we discussed this in the very first lecture, my own list of seven criteria uh, on which we could evaluate the success of the economy. Uh, prosperity, security, innovation, choice, equality, sustainability, and then democracy, something we don't always talk about uh, when we're talking about uh, the economy. So that was my list, and I stressed uh, in that first class, it's not the be-all and end-all list, and we had uh, a bit of uh, input uh, on the Q&A about um, what criteria other people might choose, which are uh, equally, uh, equally legitimate. Uh, so using my list of seven uh, uh, subjects, if you like, if uh, capitalism was a, a kid at school and we had to give them a report card on their seven subjects that I listed out, uh, I have uh, prepared a, a report card uh, on the economy. And for those that did uh, get the uh, the book, Economics for Everyone, 
uh, page 362 uh, has that report card. Uh, so in those seven classes, uh, seven subjects um, that uh, we evaluated uh, the economy on, uh, prosperity, uh, we gave it a grade uneven and inadequate. Uh, significant progress has been made, certainly for uh, many groups of uh, human beings, but many others uh, have been left uh, behind. And given our technology and knowledge and ability to produce goods and services, uh, we have billions of people uh, living in hardship in the world, many millions in Canada. Uh, it's not just a third world problem. And we have the capacity as a human race to give everyone a decent standard of living. There is no doubt about that economically. And we're failing there. Uh, I, uh, I argued that security was a criteria in its own right, quite apart from whether you're actually poor or not. Even if you're not poor, but there's a prospect you could become poor, you could be thrown into poverty uh, because of losing your job or some other calamity. That itself takes a toll on you. Even if you never end up poor, uh, the risk of becoming poor uh, is a, a, a stressor and a negative thing in life, an important negative thing in life. And people are precarious. There's no doubt about it uh, in, in most countries, including uh, Canada. Uh, innovation, uh, this was a, a kind of a mixed, a nuanced grade uh, for our student. Energetic innovation, no doubt about it. The profit motive uh, leads people to think of all kinds of interesting uh, things, ideas, uh, new products, new processes, new ways of working. Problem is uh, they need to apply their talent to more important priorities. Sometimes innovation works in incredible ways and the uh, quick uh, development and rollout of uh, vaccines against COVID are a, a historic example of uh, how innovation can work for good. On the other hand, sometimes innovation works uh, in terrible ways. Um, uh, uh, artificial intelligence systems on your smartphone that to listen to your conversations so that they can send you an ad for what you talked about buying. Uh, do you ever notice that on Facebook? Uh, or um, digital technologies in an Amazon warehouse that program the worker to move their arm to the right height so they can pick up the box, the next box, uh, with a second or two less time. Uh, and other ways that innovation is, uh, is used in ways that undermine our lives rather than enriching our lives. On the subject of choice, uh, abundant but often superficial. Uh, you've got a lot of different kinds of toothpaste uh, to buy at the store, including one that I tried recently made out of charcoal. Have you have you tried that one? I didn't realize until I got home and brushed my teeth and it came out black. Why on earth am I brushing my teeth with black toothpaste? That was too much choice uh, in my regard. Uh, but uh, what about other choices? Uh, choices about where to live, uh, what your job is going to be, um, when to work. Uh, and other uh, more fundamental life choices than what brand of toothpaste you use. Uh, equality, the subject of equality, the student gets an F. There is no doubt about it. It is an abysmal uh, failure. Uh, capitalism has the um, tendency, not just the tendency, the drive to create and recreate a huge inequality by virtue of the way the system works. And we've talked about it, uh, the way that there is a fundamental difference between the 85% of people in Canada who have to work in a wage labor relationship to support themselves, work for someone else under their direction and return for compensation, and the 2% of Canadians who own enough financial and business wealth that they don't have to work at all. That is an absolute fundamental schism between different groups of uh, Canadians and it reinforces itself as the system operates. If we were to do something really radical, like take all of the wealth in Canada today and then divide it up into 36 million equal pieces and give everyone an equal share of it, I can assure you that within two decades, we'd be back to the same type of inequality that we have today because of how the system uh, operates. So uh, it is just capitalism is programmed to reproduce an, uh, inequality on an ongoing basis. Uh, sustainability, uh, I gave it a, a poor grade, short-sighted and passes the buck. Uh, the failure to really engage and take um, sustainability seriously is undermining our future progress and certainly uh, threatening the uh, quality of life for billions uh, of people around the world. Hopefully, we're going to overcome this and people are going to take it seriously. We had the Glasgow summit and we're trying to move on this uh, in Canada, but we still face um, opposition that comes from that profit motive. The fact that there are industries that make huge profits uh, from polluting activities is a barrier to doing what would actually help. Uh, finally, democracy, uh, one-sided and uh, incomplete. Corporations, uh, in a way, have a very effective 
democratic uh, governance structure, but it's a democracy that is one share, one vote. Uh, and it, it, op it operates quickly and efficiently and ruthlessly to make sure that corporations uh, operate in uh, the most profit-maximizing way possible. Um, for the rest of us, uh, democracy is limited, uh, first of all, by the economic inequality that's around us. So you can elect a government, uh, but the government doesn't control the economy, that's clear. And uh, people with money, uh, companies that make investment decisions, uh, continue to exert disproportionate influence uh, on the economy, regardless of what happens in an election. And also the fact that uh, when we go to work, we usually walk through a curtain, leaving democracy behind and entering uh, something like a dictatorship uh, where we just have to do what the employer says. That's not democracy uh, at all, unless you've got, uh, first of all, a union and a collective agreement and rules that protect you. Uh, you're not living in a democracy from nine to five, that's for sure. Uh, so those were my grades on my seven criteria. I gave it an overall uh, mediocre pass. Passes by default. Uh, there's huge potential in the knowledge uh, that we have, huge potential in our capacity to work and use our brains and brawn, produce goods and services that are essential to a high quality life. We could give a high quality life to every person on this planet. There is no doubt about that, uh, but we don't. And that is a, a, an, an enormous failing and we should strive to do better. Uh, so here's my little uh, schoolboy coming home uh, with a report card. You can do much better than this young man. Marginal pass. The main reason capitalism continues to pass is we haven't yet figured out what the effective alternative is going to be. And uh, I don't think that's uh, a reason to stop looking for an alternative. On the other hand, uh, we live in this economy and we might as well think about how to improve it. Um, and there's lots of ways that we can improve it. Uh, there have been some uh, over the years who've argued that these problems and failures of capitalism will bring the system down, internal contradictions and crises. Uh, Karl Marx, uh, who we studied in our, our session on the history of uh, economics, uh, believed that uh, those contradictions uh, in the economy, uh, tendency to boom and bust uh, crises, uh, he thought that long-term decline in the rate of profit uh, on, on uh, production that hasn't really happened. In fact, uh, profits have increased a lot uh, during the neoliberal era in particular. And the a tendency of the system to um, lead to the immiseration of workers, to push living standards down to a bare minimum, uh, which is visible in some, some cases, but in other cases, we've been able to support and lift uh, living standards for workers. His view was that the system would uh, enter some kind of terminal crisis, uh, including both economic and political mechanisms. Um, that hasn't really come about, uh, you know, a century and a half after he was making that argument, capitalism is still here. Um, there's this kind of similar argument that we hear from some environmentalists, so those who argue that the problem uh, in the environment is economic growth and, and that it's going to confront uh, environmental limits, the limits to growth, and that's going to cause the, the system to collapse. Um, and, you know, we talked a bit about that in our session on the environment, whether indeed that will happen and somehow the, sim the system itself is um, uh, jeopardized by environmental pollution. Certainly human well-being is jeopardized by environmental pollution. But again, I'm not convinced that the system itself couldn't function in a very polluted, warming world. I think that uh, private profit-seeking businesses would f still find ways to make money uh, out of that unless we... Um, uh, unless we regulate it and stop those activities and find other ways of organizing uh, our work. So I remain skeptical of the idea that uh, somehow the, cap the capitalist economy is going to fail of its own accord. I'm sensitive and angered by the failures of the system that we see around us, but um, I don't think the system itself is going to stop unless we um, bring about fundamental change. And I think the ultimate uh, limits to capitalism are more political uh, in terms of people saying this isn't acceptable, we have to do things differently uh, rather than economic. And, you know, to be realistic, uh, there's lots of reasons why um, the system could face fundamental uh, insecurity and uh, perhaps break down. I don't know. Uh, some of the sources, potential sources of uh, what you'd call systemic or structural instability in the economy uh, should be obvious now that we've finished the course. One of them is the financial system. We saw how that is a house of cards based on the ability of banks to create money out of thin air and then allocate that money to doing useless speculative things, buying Bitcoin, driving up the price of housing 
and other manias uh, that produce financial bubbles for a while, but every bubble always bursts. Um, another uh, potential source uh, is the uh, global imbalances, imbalances in the international economy, where some countries like uh, Korea, say, or Germany, uh, China, uh, run very significant and ongoing trade surpluses. Their industries are very successful internationally and they sell a lot more than they buy. And that has been beneficial to those economies. There's no doubt about it, but it's been harmful for other economies that aren't as uh, competitive. And how long can those international imbalances that are financed with debt, basically international debt is required to allow a country to keep buying more than it sells. Uh, how long can that go on uh, either with uh, without an economic response or a political response, as we saw with some of the protectionism that Donald Trump was putting in place in other uh, other countries. Again, this whole issue of uh, environmental limits and whether the economy's ability to extract resources from the national environment uh, will be stopped or the economy's ability to put pollution into the environment will be stopped in ways, again, that are not just about making life unbearable for human beings. Uh, that should be the ultimate criteria, but whether it actually stops and interferes with the logic of uh, private profit and uh, production in a, in a capitalist economy. That's what I'm, I'm genuinely not sure of. Um, I think there may be a, a source of sort of structural weakness in terms of the declining um, willingness and uh, vitality of private investment or capital accumulation. Uh, in theory, capitalism is driven by the desire of private companies to make profit, and that make investments, start businesses, use new technologies, hire people, produce stuff, sell it, and hope that they've got a profit left at the end of the day. And there are times in the history of capitalism where that uh, drive was incredibly energetic. And the, uh, the early economists like Adam Smith and David Ricardo uh, celebrated this incredible, uh, they called it the animal spirits uh, of capital, the, the, the fact that uh, investors and entrepreneurs just were driven uh, to build these big companies and invest more and in reality, uh, we've seen companies investing less, much less than they used to, including during the neoliberal era, even though this whole economy has been reorganized in order to enhance business power and business profits. And it has certainly done that. Uh, it has not elicited more uh, investment. In fact, it's elicited less. Um, and that means that the sort of fundamental engine that drives capitalism might be running out of gas, no matter how much we dangle a big carrot in front of these uh, companies in order to get them to invest more. They aren't, uh, which means we need to find another engine uh, to drive uh, the economy. Uh, I, of course, have spent uh, most of my career working in the labor relations field. And uh, the fact that um, in, in many workplaces, in many industries, not all, but in many, there's just a, a growing kind of gap between the, the power of uh, employers and the kind of uh, precariousness and desperation and exploitation that are faced by workers. How long are workers going to put up with that sort of uh, inequality in the workplace? That's an open question. Um, <clears throat> a couple that I've been thinking about in recent years as I've watched kind of Donald Trump and uh, there's populist movements and authoritarian movements uh, in different parts of the world, including signs of it in Canada. Luckily, um, small minority signs of it so far. Um, but, you know, is there a situation where large numbers of people just become so alienated uh, from the system and skeptical that anything works, including democracy, uh, that you get these uh, these um, outbreaks of authoritarian or um, just very antisocial um, uh, sentiment and behavior? Uh, you know, the anti-vaxxers uh, blocking the access to hospitals, you know, was an example of that and then much worse examples uh, in terms of what that means for, for politics. And in the advanced, there's nothing inherently democratic about capitalism, and we've, we saw that in history. Capitalism was not a democratic system when it was formed. We had to fight and win democracy. Um, but in the last century, for sure, in the advanced capitalist world, the functioning of a stable system of liberal democracy was very important to maintaining the social legitimacy and stability of that system. And if we actually saw a breakdown where people just said the whole thing's corrupt, you know, fake news, uh, it's a dictatorship, Donald Trump did win the election, not Joe Biden, uh, we get an outbreaks of those sorts of sentiments, it's really hard to see where that whole system uh, would go. 
Um, and a kind of related question that may, I was thinking about during the pandemic is we saw um, in many countries, not all, and not Canada, in many countries, we just saw a fundamental crisis of state capacity uh, to respond to problems and address crises and manage responses. Um, you know, in America, you clearly had a situation where the government literally didn't have the capacity to implement uh, war, um, health measures, protections, uh, distancing, uh, and effective rollouts of vaccines. Some of that ties to the previous point about the uh, the growth of uh, kind of anti um, anti science populism. Uh, but some of it actually reflects just this starved, underdeveloped nature and, and state of uh, public services and state capacity. And we've seen in our discussion on history and on government, capitalism has always needed a very strong, effective government. The, the idea that capitalism and government are opposites is nonsense. They, they've worked hand in hand. And if we have a situation where, for various reasons, just government can't do the job, uh, then that's going to threaten, in, potentially, in some fundamental way, the stability of the system. So these are reasons why we need to watch this and why I think there's big problems afoot. Um, but I'm, my own view is still that the, the system is not going to collapse of its own accord. Uh, we are going to change it because we demand change as human beings, um, and we see uh, ways of doing it better. Uh, this is just a, one graph to put up to, to address that point of the uh, eroding work ethic uh, of capitalism. Private businesses investing less in actual new capital and technology and machinery and robots. You know, we've had all kinds of hype about how we're all going to be replaced by robots. And the reality is uh, businesses in Canada and around the world are investing way less in technology than they used to, even though the technology is there and it could be used. Uh, you see this graph, uh, which is from the, the textbook, showing a, a, a decline by two thirds in the amount of new investment after paying off the wear and tear and depreciation of existing capital, the amount of new investment being pumped into the economy during the neoliberal era. And this is when we restructured uh, society and social programs and tax programs and labor policies to make investment more attractive. And yet uh, they invest less. And exactly the same trend is visible in Canada and it gets much worse during the pandemic. This line is now down to about zero, barely above zero. Uh, so um, in this way, that, that sort of fundamental engine that's supposed to drive the economy uh, is um, maybe running out of gas. Uh, there's still a lot of money uh, up at the top, you know. We got Jeff Bezos, you know, uh, himself, uh, uh, $150 billion in his personal wealth. And he, he takes this uh, money and, and does really, really important, innovative things like building a rocket that looks like a, a flaming penis, as far as I can tell. I don't know if that's just me, uh, to put himself into space. What an absolutely useless and it's insulting thing to do, especially at a moment when billions of uh, Canadians uh, are billions of people in the world uh, are, are fearing for their lives. And, you know, he's made a lot of money through his company, but the uh, amount of actual investment driving the economy forward is uh, is falling. Uh, and this is, to me, thinks this is uh, the modern day equivalent of building pyramids. You know, another economic system that had a rich group at the top that extracted surplus and did useless things with it, like build giant tombs for themselves. And uh, at some point, um, apart from the moral bankruptcy of this. Uh, there's also the fact that if all this money is flowing to the top and they're not doing anything with it, other than stupid things like the rocket ships, then uh, what does that say about the vitality and momentum of the whole uh, economy? Uh, can we do better? Uh, absolutely, we can. Uh, lots of evidence that the economy uh, that we live under and uh, around the world is failing to meet human needs. It's uh, wasting our potential. It's causing chaos, war, and premature death. And uh, we see that enough evidence of that in Canada. And then we see uh, much more dramatic evidence uh, internationally. Uh, the drive to produce private profit and innovate is supposed to lead to abundance. Uh, yet we are constantly told that we have to make do with less, not have more. Uh, it's, we're, we're confronted with the opposite of abundance, even though we have the economic potential uh, to give everybody a, a comfortable and safe life. Um, we can do better. The system itself uh, uh, passes by default, um, largely for want of a convincing alternative, I would argue, uh, but um, it can certainly, certainly be improved. 
Now, uh, I'm going to say this one more time. I've said this about 100 times during our class, and I'm going to say it once more today. The economy is the sum total of our work, uh, using our brains and brawn, uh, the productive human labor to produce the goods and services uh, that we need, adding value uh, to the materials that we harvest from nature. That is what the economy is. Uh, no more and no less. So and if that's the core lesson, uh, what are we actually held back by? You know, we're, we're told that, uh, that, that things are scarce. We're told that we have to tighten our belts. What is actually scarce in our economy? What's holding us back? Not money. Okay, we've seen uh, when we studied the financial system, money is created out of thin air every time a private bank decides to issue a loan. It could be created out of thin air if a public bank decided to issue a loan to do something useful, more useful than buy Bitcoin or drive up the price of housing. Uh, we could create money out of thin air to finance uh, building daycare centers and uh, providing uh, public services to people. Capital, uh, in the economic sense, capital is the tools and machinery that we have. In the financial world, it's just money, what we call finance, money that's used to start production for companies. That's not scarce. Uh, again, you know, if somebody comes with a very convincing business plan uh, and convinces the banking system to fund it, there's no limit at all on what they can do. This is how a company like Uber, uh, which has never made a single dollar in profit, uh, can leverage money through the banking system to keep it going uh, to the tune of $80 billion in market value. Uh, so there's no shortage of money, no shortage of capital. There's n It's not government revenues that are holding us back uh, either. And we saw that big time during the pandemic. The federal government uh, ran a deficit of $380 billion. That's a big deficit by any standard uh, during the worst uh, year of the pandemic. And it was vital that they did that. And they did amazing things with it, including setting up an economic momentum that gave us 158,000 new jobs uh, in November. Uh, so uh, those aren't the things that hold us back. If the economy is the sum total of our work, the only thing holding us back is our work, our capacity to work, and of course, the natural environment in which we live and work and harvest uh, materials. Uh, so um, making sure that we work and work to the best of our ability and then use the fruits of our labor, the things that we produce in order in a smart way, in ways that benefit the human condition rather than sending billionaires into space uh, is the, the, the only thing holding us back. So we want to make the economy better. Let's make the best of our capacity uh, to work. And this is my logic when I uh, propose uh, a vision that I call a, a high investment, full employment, sustainable economy. Uh, not the catchiest phrase. Uh, and again, I said before, I'm the economist, I'm not the marketer. So uh, I got to come up with a, a, a better name for this. It's, it's similar to what, an idea that we hear a lot uh, nowadays, this idea of a Green New Deal, that maybe uh, you've heard some uh, folks uh, in the US, but in other countries, including Canada, talking about um, the idea of uh, mobilizing investment, public and private, uh, creating large numbers of new jobs, uh, putting people to work, and uh, a core part of that work being um, uh, addressing the environmental challenges that are uh, undermining quality of life in so many places. So um, investment is critical. And this, again, is one reason why I'm, in a way, intrigued by the idea that capitalists have forgotten how to invest. They've forgotten how to do their job uh, in a capitalist uh, economy. And I, you know, I, I know I sound critical sometimes, but I don't want to sound like I'm blaming individual capitalists for the whole thing. Okay. I'm not, I'm not like pointing my finger at Jeff Bezos and the rest of them. I'm not saying they're, they're greedy and lazy. I am saying that perhaps they've been locked into an unfortunate cycle of dependence. Okay. They've learned how to make easy money through a neoliberal economy that's stacked in their favor and have forgotten what they're supposed to do, uh, which is put money into motion and real uh, growth and capital accumulation and technology and employment. So we need investment, we need more of it, and we need it in better places. Uh, and we're not getting it despite the huge carrot that we dangle in front of uh, private business. Uh, so we got to rearrange uh, the motivation and, you know, in a way, put more gas in that engine that's supposed to be uh, driving our economy. Uh, but again, the goal is not just growth, it's certainly not. Uh, higher GDP means nothing if it is uh, uh, not benefiting uh, human uh, quality of life and uh, the state of our environment. Uh, so then we have to regulate us. Uh, uh, again, as my Australian colleague 
uh, Richard Dennis, a wonderful guy, uh, loves to say it's not the size of the economy so much as the shape. It isn't the rate of growth so much as its direction uh, that determines whether um, we're better off or not. Uh, and there's a whole toolbox that governments can use to make this happen, a whole set of different policy levers that uh, they have at their disposal, uh, most of which we've talked about in this course. Uh, the fiscal policy of government, the taxing and spending, uh, macroeconomic and monetary policy, uh, the actions of the central bank and how we regulate the financial system, uh, public investment in infrastructure and services, uh, innovation and technology policy, uh, our trade policies, our labor and social policies. We could get all of our ducks in order, swimming in the same direction, and uh, really get an economy that was getting a lot more investment than we're getting now in ways that benefit us a lot more than the investment we have now. Um, and uh, instead of depending so much on private investment to lead the way, as we do today, there still would be private investment. This would still be a capitalist economy. It'd still have the majority of uh, our production organized through private firms. Uh, but you wouldn't be sitting back waiting for those private firms to lead the way. Uh, and you'd have all of these different um, potential uh, levers and policy avenues to uh, support the idea of an economy that's uh, investing a lot, working a lot, and then um, structuring and regulating and uh, directing that work uh, in ways that are more socially and environmentally uh, beneficial. So. Uh, and I think there's a very strong argument for this kind of a, a very ambitious uh, reorientation of the capitalist economy. Nothing that I've said so far breaks away from capitalism. Uh, it's just a, a way of managing it uh, very differently, because even on its own terms, the neoliberal recipe, which was uh, reinforce business power, reinforce business profits, reinforce business freedom, and then wait for the party to start and all the benefits to trickle down. And that hasn't worked, even on its own terms. This is, the, I think, in a way, the strongest argument. Uh, even on its own terms, we're giving them more and we're getting less uh, back. And thinking that you know every individual can find their own way through the problems that we face uh, by picking the right topic to learn at university, by picking the right programming code to learn and get a job in the tech sector, uh, that's not gonna do the trick in a, in a general way. I think what we need is a, a vision of um, rebalancing the power and the decision-making authority in our economy and putting the emphasis on um, more investment, more work, and making sure that we use what we produce uh, more wisely. Uh, so in this high investment, full employment, sustainable economy, uh, the top priority would be our work. And that makes sense because I've said the economy is the sum total of our work and getting more people to work um, is uh, the ultimate source of uh, how to improve what we're doing. And, you know, uh, the way that we have uh, rebuilt, not not totally, but rebuilt impressively from the pandemic is a, a good sign of how important it is to get people back to work, but also make sure that we're using what we produce in a way that lifts uh, human and environmental standards. Um, there's uh, one a project I just want to draw your attention to that I think is quite consistent with this vision of a high investment, full employment, sustainable economy. Got to get the communications department working on that term. We need something shorter and snappier. Um, anyways, a, a project that I've worked with uh, for many years, and it's hosted by the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives uh, that I mentioned at the outset. It's called the Alternative Federal Budget. And uh, it's, it's not just a budget. It's more a whole kind of economic and, and social plan. And uh, for anyone who's interested, I encourage you to, to check it out at the policyalternatives.ca uh, site. It is developed by a whole kind of collective of different uh, economic and social and justice organizations that uh, meet. There's about 40 of them that uh, get together and they actually develop a, a government budget as if they were the federal government. Um, but there's all kinds of other um, ideas and plans and and goals that are reflected in there, not just a, a budget uh, to create more jobs, create better jobs, uh, address uh, sustainability and protect the environment and, and share the wealth. And they also, um, just as I was arguing earlier, use all of the tools in the toolbox, line up the ducks uh, to try and make that happen. And I think it's a great project and one that I think is quite consistent with the spirit of ambitious reform but within the context of a capitalist economy uh, that I was highlighting there. 
how do you pay for it all? Of course, there's lots of uh, uh, lots of program spending and uh, investments, uh, including from the public sector, that um, uh, would be required in that kind of high investment, full employment, sustainable economy. Um, and the way you pay for it is you put people to work, you know. And uh, this uh, this is just a, a little numerical example of that uh, that's discussed in in the textbook in Economics for Everyone. Uh, at the time that that was written, that was in 2015, there were 48 million unemployed people in the advanced capitalist world. And if you put them all to work, just assuming average productivity from them, you're going to generate $4 trillion in GDP. And again, it's not growing GDP, it's the goal, it's what you do with it. Uh, on average, across those countries, uh, over a third of that new GDP would go into government coffers. Uh, just on the basis of taxes, uh, income taxes and sales taxes and so on. That's a trillion and a half dollars to support those public investments that are being made. So uh, I'm not the least bit concerned about how we pay for the investments that are required in that high investment, full employment, sustainable economy, uh, because, uh, first of all, we know the banking system can create money out of thin air. It does so every day. We just have to get it to create money for good stuff. And mostly putting people to work generates the real resources that are ultimately required uh, for that. Um, so that's, I think, a very ambitious, far-reaching uh, vision of how to get more investment, better investment, more jobs, better jobs, higher standard of living, environmental protection, all within the box of a capitalist economy, which we defined as having two defining features. Most production is undertaken by private for-profit businesses, and most work is undertaken through wage labor or paid employment. So we, we can be very capitalist about that, very different vision of capitalism, uh, one in which the capitalists themselves have less power and are forced to work more, work fair for capitalists, uh, perhaps. Uh, on the other hand, uh, I, I also think um, that in addition to you know, imagining how to approve, improve the system and get to a, a, a capitalism that works better, um, I think that we can also be thinking bigger. We can also be thinking outside of the box of an economy defined by those two features and imagine, okay, do we really always want to have our whole economic potential um, structured and constrained by the reality that we have to have private businesses making enough profit at something for it to happen? You know, and that is offset to some extent by the, the direct role of government to, in the economy. Remember, we already have a situation where 15% of our GDP is not produced by private businesses looking to make a profit. In the non-business sector, which includes direct public services and NGOs and, and uh, non-profits, 15% uh, of GDP is produced more directly to meet human needs because either taxpayers told the government they had to do this or um, agencies uh, and volunteers came together to make it happen. Um, so we already have an alternative lurking there. Um, could we imagine expanding the uh, the capacity to uh, put things, put people and things to work uh, directly to meet human and environmental needs uh, in a way that we have sort of direct democratic uh, control over? It? That's where you'd start stepping outside uh, of the box uh, of a capitalist economy. And uh, in a way, I like to think of it as a, a two-track process, okay? Every train has to have two, two tracks, and the, the one track is uh, improving the, the current system, and, and, and I have an ambitious idea of how that could happen. The other track is to uh, imagine how to kind of get out from under the thumb of the Jeff Bezoses of the world and the other private firms uh, whose, you know, willingness to do something always has to be uh, incented with a giant carrot uh, of private profit dangled in, in front of them. And uh, I, think, uh, I think it's important to be thinking of that other track, even as we're working importantly and immediately and desperately uh, to improve uh, and address some of the failures of the existing system today. And this railroad, this two-track railroad, where you're improving the system and thinking about ways to change the system, uh, inevitably, I would say, turns to the left down the way. Um, remember in our first, uh, our first uh, class, we, or no, it was our second class, we talked about the history of the economy and how it's evolved uh, through the history, the 200,000 year history of modern humans. And we've always had an economy and it's always been based on work. But how we organize the economy, including the differences between social classes in the economy, has changed uh, a lot. 
And then we left this enigmatic question mark at the bottom. What comes next? And if we are going to think about organizing an economy that steps outside of the box of uh, capitalism, of for-profit production and wage labor, what would it look like? Uh, and this is where the idea of socialism is uh, is uh, put forward as, I would say, the major alternative uh, to capitalism. It's not the only uh, alternative. There's other visions of um, uh, economies that would not be capitalist but wouldn't be socialist uh, either. For example, uh, there's a whole school of, of thought called Islamic uh, economics uh, of uh, people influenced by uh, Islam, obviously, who imagine uh, organizing a whole economy that they would see is consistent with with that, uh, there's other visions, uh, sort of a of a sort of dispersed, uh, um, very decentralized, almost kind of anarch anarchical uh, economy based on you know small independent producers, and um, perhaps mediated by all the new digital technology that we have, a sort of a high tech, small is beautiful kind of economy. Um, I would say that the the idea of a, a socialist economy is probably the 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 most um, um, uh, talked about alternative uh, to capitalism. Uh, the idea of socialism is to take on this um, one defining feature of, of capitalism, namely this idea that uh, for something to happen, a private company is going to lead the way, make an investment, organize production, and hope to make a profit at the end of the day. And that motivation for production, in a way, is a distraction from the idea of using the economy and our capacity to work to meet human needs. And are there ways in which you could um, start to <clears throat> free yourself from reliance on the uh, private businesses doing that in order to organize economic activity and um, <clears throat> socialize the ownership of that capital so that it's not dependent on the private owner uh, taking the leadership and making stuff happen. And you could socialize that capital in terms of the real manifestation of capital, the structures and the equipment and the machinery and the robots and the, and the, the mines and the offices and the retail stores, et cetera. And or you could socialize it in the financial world uh, in terms of how um, these um, assets are owned and managed. Uh, <clears throat> I think that there is potential to think about um, ways to organize economic activity and organize the ownership of uh, the enterprises that undertake economic activity and not through a sort of, you know, one big blow up, overthrow the system uh, kind of a thing. Uh, I would argue that this idea of operating the economy in a, a more democratic, socialized uh, way that is not dependent on private profit uh, could be uh, implemented uh, in particular places where it makes a practical difference, where you can make a concrete argument about how this would actually make the economy work better. And in the textbook, I list several examples where I think the failure of private for-profit production is particularly obvious and where strong arguments can be made that this would really work better if we undertook it uh, ourselves. We've, we already have that argument, of course, in a lot of public services uh, around healthcare and education. Um, and I think there's other areas where we can make a similarly strong case that these things make more sense to deliver uh, through um, nonprofit means where we're, uh, as a community, putting in place the, the resources and the leadership and the investment um, to organize production and, and use it. And around the world, even some of the places that got some of the industries that got privatized during the early days of neoliberalism, uh, there's strong demands to bring them back in. Uh, to the realm of public or socialized uh, production. In Britain, the privatized trains were a disaster. So there's a strong uh, pressure and it's been partly successful to bring the train system back into public ownership. In Germany, uh, many, many municipalities have republicized, uh, taken back into public ownership, um, the um, utilities, electric and sewer and water utilities that were privatized in the heyday of neoliberalism. Uh, a strong argument, I think, could be made in energy or housing or food, uh, housing in particular these days, because the private for-profit provision of housing is driving a bubble that uh, so that millions and millions and millions of Canadians have no hope whatsoever of thinking they would ever own a house in that private for-profit system. Uh, we need an absolute resuscitation of 
nonprofit housing in all kinds of ways, public housing, but co-ops and housing trusts and community trusts and other ways where housing is provided so that people have a roof over their head as opposed to a speculative uh, financial asset. Um, so uh, in the textbook again, on uh, page 392, uh, for anyone who's got it, uh, I list uh, a number of different examples from around the world, different industries and different companies about how real production uh, can be socialized, uh, including through uh, public corporations like crown corporations or state-owned businesses, but a whole range of other ways, uh, cooperatives, trusts, uh, a new innovation that's called benefit corporations or B corporations. This is where it is a company, it's an enterprise, uh, <clears throat> but it's set up with a different mission and a different legal mandate. Unlike a company today, which is legally obliged to maximize profit as its, uh, as its operation, that's what's called the fiduciary responsibility of a company, B corps or benefit corporations are actually empowered with the legal mandate to, to do some good, to go and meet some other social objective rather than just uh, their own uh, profit. So lots of examples of how this can happen. Same goes for the financial sector and how we could uh, socialize ownership uh, in, in that sense, uh, including through public banks, credit unions, uh, public investment funds, sovereign wealth funds, uh, which are very important. Think of a place like Singapore, a uh, very interesting case where the government has a publicly owned sovereign wealth fund that invests in the equities of different companies and then uses their equity stake to try and leverage investment decisions from those companies that they think will lead to a stronger uh, economy, more innovation, more manufacturing, uh, more desired industries in Singapore. Uh, in Japan, the central bank owns about 15% of all corporate equities uh, because of the use of the central bank in quantitative easing and trying to stimulate purchasing power. They've ended up by de facto, uh, in a way, partly socializing uh, the investment of the capitalist uh, uh, businesses in Japan. And they've been very passive about doing this, but you, if you had an, a vision, you could use that uh, to really, I think, redirect and get better performance uh, from, from those companies. There is an old uh, urban myth. I'll just take a couple more minutes. Uh, I'm almost done. I know I'm uh, at the end of my hour, but I gotta get to the punchline in this last uh, class. There is an urban myth that uh, humans are inevitably and inherently greedy and that the idea of an economy that's somehow more collective and more participatory and more sharing is just uh, runs against that human nature. And that assumption that people are inherently greedy is uh, in a way the, the starting point of conventional neoclassical supply and demand economics. Uh, if you've ever studied it at university, you learn the, one of the first principles and one of the first axioms uh, that is the starting assumptions of the whole theory is that people uh, go through their life trying to maximize their own personal utility is the word that's called for it, which means uh, by and large, get more stuff. And businesses operate on trying to maximize their own profit. And if you try to somehow mess with nature in, in that regard, you're going to end up in tears. And, and this is just a myth. It's just scientifically wrong. Uh, any uh, academics who've studied uh, the human history from any perspective other than economics would just break out laughing at this assumption that greed is the only thing that motivates humans. They would just say, what are you talking about? Look around the world. You know, when you see firefighters running into a building to save someone else, are they doing it out of greed? You know, when you see parents getting up in the middle of the night to care for the kids, are they doing it out of greed? Uh, motivations for human activity are far more diverse and complex than that. And in fact, if you look at the, the, the evolution of humanity, uh, social anthropologists uh, are unanimous that it's our unique ability to cooperate that explains why we survived when we came down from the trees and uh, our social intelligence, our language skills. But we are the only species on earth where unrelated individuals, they're not all in the same family, unrelated individuals cooperate on complex tasks. You know, you have wolf packs, but they're all related. You have uh, beehives, but they're all related. And human beings have the unique ability to come together and get stuff done together. And that is absolutely the reason why we survived and, you know, came to spread ourselves and, and our footprint for good or for worse around uh, the world. And so there's no question at all that this somehow violates uh, human nature. And in fact, you could argue it's our collective self-interest rather than an individualistic get more stuff for myself. But our collective self-interest 
that recognizes that doing stuff together, including through democratic uh, planning and oversight of the economy, uh, is the key uh, ingredient for building a better economy where we have better lives and a better environment. So uh, how do we make all that happen? Uh, I've got one track, which is a very ambitious, uh, far-reaching vision for uh, changing capitalism. I've got another track, uh, which is even more ambitious uh, in terms of thinking outside the box of capitalism and thinking of other ways that we can organize work directly meet human needs. Um, I am always, uh, always guided by one of the first things I learned as a young reform activist uh, in my teens, uh, the old slogan, educate, organize and mobilize. Uh, important first step is to uh, uh, educate folks that the current way we run the economy is not natural, it's not permanent, it's not inevitable, it's not set in stone, it's not driven by human nature. Uh, that in, in fact it reflects choices and it reflects competing interests uh, and it reflects um, power balances in society. So understand how it works, first of all, then organize uh, to give people uh, more of a say and more influence and then uh, mobilize, uh, get out there in every way we can from talking to our neighbors to forming a union, to voting in an election, to raising hell. Uh, about things that we think are absolutely unacceptable in the economy. And there's enough things for us to be angry about in that regard uh, that, that we should all be uh, active in one way or another on that. And I am ultimately optimistic that uh, we'll make a difference in that. We will succeed in building a better economy. We have to. Um, and it is we're not held back by scarcity. The only thing that's scarce is our capacity to work. And we've got lots of that. It's not held back by human nature and greed. Uh, it's all a question about what we think is most important and how we organize, uh, how we organize that and uh, use our capacity to work, our brains and brawn, uh, to meet human needs. And that optimism and confidence is what keeps me going every morning as a, as an economist, uh, along with a, a little dose of uh, my socialist Prozac, which I take uh, with my orange juice. <laughs>